so like Rachel said, I am a PhD student at the Media Lab. And my background is primarily in sort of engineering and design. And I'm really interested in thinking about how we can design interfaces that support uh, collective and collaborative activities of all kinds. Um, and so tonight, I'm going to uh, I'm at a phase in the program where I'm sort of getting a little bit reflective. Like I've done a couple of things and I'm sort of, I can see the path towards the end. And so I started thinking about like, what are the threads that pull everything together? So the plan tonight is I'm going to do a little bit of talking about uh, some theory stuff that I really like. And I promise it won't be too scary. We'll just do a little bit of a taste. And then talk about two specific projects I've done that sort of illustrate the kinds of theory stuff that I think is really interesting and point a direction towards how you guys might use it in your own work. Um, so I hope you'll indulge me with this. I hope it'll be uh, interesting and not too, not too heavy. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to start with anyway, is this uh, notion of common ground. And this comes from uh, Herb Clark, uh, a bunch of work he did in this area. And we'll start with this quote where he says that all collective actions are built on common ground and its accumulations. So. What's interesting here, I think, is, is the metaphor. We've got this sort of notion that common ground is something that we accumulate as we interact with people. It sort of builds up the foundation, and we can actively build stuff on top of it. That We can build conversations, we can build agreement, um, and we can build sort of stuff moving forward. It's really the foundation for interactions between people. That seems like a really important thing to understand. So we'll take a quick tour through, through this. And I'll be pulling out of these two papers. Uh, the one on the right is a, is a cognitive science paper that's kind of scary. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're really serious. The one on the left is super accessible, and it's really focused on um, bringing these sort of, this one's very interested in sort of language and mechanically how do people reach agreement on like a sentence by sentence level. Um, then the one on the left sort of takes some of those lessons, explains them in a much easier way, and then abstracts it to talk about different kinds of media, like instant messaging and email and chat rooms and that kind of thing. Um, but together, I think they're a really nice, really nice pair. So if this kind of stuff that I'm talking about at the beginning seems interesting, you should definitely go take a look at those. Okay, so uh, let's start with this idea of common ground. What, is, what does Clark mean when he says common ground? So what's tricky about common ground is that it's not simply the set of things that people all know. So if each of those circles is the set of things that like person A knows and person B knows, it's not just the intersection of those. It's the intersection of those that everybody knows that everybody else knows. It's this kind of weirdly recursive thing. So the way to think about it is if I know if I'm like a really big Red Sox fan, and you're a really big Red Sox fan, but I don't know that you're a really big Red Sox fan, we can't talk about the Red Sox until we've established that connection. We don't know that that's a bit of common ground that we both share. So it's really the, the common ground that we can have conversations about is really this tiny subset. And a lot of what we do when we talk to people is to figure out both, both where that overlap is and try and add things into that overlap. So yeah, so when we talk about common ground, we're really talking about the sort of chunk in the middle of everybody who's participating in some interaction, the stuff that everybody knows that everybody else knows. And we'll come back to this uh, recursion issue um, as we go through this. So the core question that I think we should be concerned about tonight is how do we add things to common ground? If common ground is this accumulation and this foundation that we build other stuff on top of, how do we get stuff in there? How do we make it so we can build out of it? So, Clark suggests in this kind of uh, convoluted way that what we have to do is establish for each utterance the mutual belief that addressees have understood what the speaker meant. So this is just getting back to this notion of mutual belief, that it's not enough that I say something to you and it's not enough for you to have understood it. I need to know that you understood it for us to move on and for it to sort of reach that common ground level. So if we just imagine like a really simple model for this, and Clark is really interested in models primarily, so like the simplest model would be I say a thing to you and you say I understand. And then I say I understand that you understand because we got to get that mutualness. But that takes a lot of time and it's sort of this infinitely recursive thing. We can't just keep going back and forth doing that. We don't get anywhere. And that's not actually how people communicate. That's not a realistic model. So what, what Clark is trying to say, Clark puts together this, uh, this system where he says, all right, let's model things as a contribution. And contribution has two parts. It has a presentation and an acceptance. So uh, these are sort of his particular vocabulary words. But the way you can think about this is a presentation is just the thing I'm trying to communicate to you. So if I say, I'm going to lunch, that's my, that's my presentation. But that's only part of the contribution. It's not enough for me just to say I'm going to lunch. I need to know that you, that you received that, that you understood that I'm going to lunch. So there's a second part, which is the acceptance. I need you to do something that lets me know that you understood my presentation. So 
what Clark's real contribution was here is to lay out the ways that things can get accepted. And this is really pretty intuitive, uh, but what he did is just put names on stuff that you, you hear and do every day without really thinking about it. So he said there's three ways that somebody can accept a presentation. So the first way is acknowledgement. So this is just saying, yeah, okay. So if I say I'm going to lunch, you say, all right, and we're done. You've accepted my presentation, and we've, we've had a contribution. That's a bit of knowledge that we both share now. Uh, acknowledgements can also be things like nodding. It can be uh-huhs, yes. It doesn't have to be speech necessarily. It's just something that says, all right, got it. Uh, so the next one down is a relevant next turn. So basically, this is if I say I'm going to lunch, and you say something that uh, shows you understand that I'm going to lunch. So if I say I'm going to lunch, and you say, and I, and so I say I'm going to lunch, and you say, who are you going with? You've acknowledged that I've said I'm going to lunch, and you've asked a reasonable question in response to that. So without having to do an actual acknowledgement pair, you've just behaved like you understood it. Um, you might mess that up if I say I'm going to lunch, and you say, where are you going? I might say I'm going to lunch, because I think you misunderstood where I was going, when in fact you were asking for more detail. So you can have some disconnects here, and those just end up in more sort of presentation accept pairs, and we'll show some diagrams of that in a second. Um, so, so relevant next turns are just, I say something, you say something reasonable in response, we're done. We've got our accept, we've got our present accept pair. And the last thing, the sort of weakest evidence that you understand what's going on, is that you just keep paying attention. That if I say, if I say I'm going to lunch and you just sort of stare at me, that's okay. I mean, you haven't said you didn't understand, you haven't done anything else, but you're also still there. You clearly, you seem to have heard it, so in the absence of other evidence, that might be enough. Uh, so, in, in general, we like the sort of stronger evidence, but we can deal with the weaker evidence if we have to. So, Clark does this little diagramming exercise, and we'll only do two of these really quickly, where there's apparently this corpus, I had no idea before I read this, in the 80s, someone put together, they basically installed microphones around a building and recorded a bunch of conversations, and then anonymized them all out, and then just did this transcription. And the transcriptions have these sort of Actually, this one's not so bad, but some of them have this like crazy syntax that describes sort of gaps in time between people. Maybe you guys have seen this stuff before. But these really detailed transcripts that are all about capturing the uh -huh's and the yeahs, and it's sort of overwhelming. But anyway, so they've got this huge corpus, and so what he's trying to do is apply this to real conversations. Because um, he's really reacting to people who have these much more simple models of conversation that are much more about transmission, where I like send an idea to you and you don't have to acknowledge, you just agree, and then you send an idea back. He's fighting back against that, and so he's trying to say, look, when we look at this, this real conversation data, the system I'm proposing works. So in these systems, what he's got here is the C is contribution. So the contribution has a present, the PR, and the accept, the AC. And he's not telling you what kind of accept, but uh, we'll go through. So, the first contribution is this question. How far is it from Huddersfield to Coventry? And so A says that. B says uh, it's about 100 miles. So that's an accept on the first present because he did a reasonable thing in response. They asked a question about distance. The person responded with a distance. OK, that's a relevant next turn. So we're done with that set. Um, but that's also a presentation. They've presented some information back to you that you need to accept. So then A says, so in fact, if you were living in London, They've sort of done a reasonable thing after talking about this distance. They've moved on to the next thing. So basically, this is the simplest way it works. I say a thing, you say a reasonable thing back, and then we just go back and forth. And in each, each turn, we're presenting, accepting, presenting, accepting. Um, it can get a little bit crazy, though. This is a, a more elaborate one, where we've got these sort of trees that pop out. Um, it's not super important that you like be able to produce these things, and I don't know if people really do anymore, but um, what's interesting about it is just to see how it can cascade. So, we start with somebody saying, so what are we going to do about this boy? The person asks a clarifying question, Duveen, because they're not sure who this refers to. So there's a sort of hanging identifier. They try and clear that up. That is itself a presentation. That gets accepted by the other person saying, uh-huh. And then since B knows that the first one was about Duveen, then they can go back and answer that one again. And then that's part of accepting the first one. So they sort of go in a level, do some clarification, back out a level. So it's sort of a, a hierarchical system here. So, Anyway, this is really a long way to say that I think this is a pretty good model. I think it sort of explains some stuff that we take for granted when we're talking to people. Um, and it also shows how we avoid that recursion problem, that we've got these things you can do where you just say a reasonable thing, and that shortcut's having to just recurse infinitely, where I say a thing, and then you say a thing, and we sort of have to agree on every little detail. So I think it's a pretty cool model. Okay, so what I want to take away from this model is that 
this is, I think, a nice way to think about how stuff gets into common ground. You've got these pairs, you present, you accept, you've got a contribution, that's a thing we agree on and we both know that we agree on it, we can move on. The other thing Clark talks about is this uh, question of costs. So when he starts talking about different kinds of media, he's interested in how when we're on the phone is this process different than when we're face to face versus when we're, on, we're sending email versus when we're in a chat room. And he has this huge list of costs, and we're not going to go into all of them, um, but we'll talk about four that I think are relevant to uh, this kind of audience. So one is production costs. So the nicest way to think about this is that it's a difference between speaking and typing. So we type a lot slower than we speak, so it, it takes more time to produce written text than it does to produce speech. So in situations where we have to type, creating an utterance just takes longer. Uh, startup costs are also familiar. It's like overhead. It's like starting your instant messenger client. That if you're not online already and you need to boot something up, or if you have to like sign up for Twitter to take part in some Twitter thing, like that's a worse startup cost. So startup costs will influence like how long people have conversations and what kinds of channels they choose. Uh, speaker change costs we'll talk a lot about later, um, but it's basically how do you negotiate whose turn it is to talk. Uh, and so those costs can go up and down in different channels and will affect how people work. And then display costs have to do with uh, whether or not we're seeing the same thing. So like, if we're in the room together, it's easy for me to point at stuff. We've got some share visual, shared visual, visual space. But if we're on the phone, I can't point at a thing on my desk and say, oh, can you see the thing on my desk? I have to like, provide a lot of extra detail. So whether or not we have that easy display shared um, influences how easily I can talk about visual stuff around me. So the question I want to talk about uh, that'll sort of guide the rest of the talk here is how can we make it easier to add to common ground? We've got this nice way to do it with speech, but when we go into mediated environments, when we're talking online, we're talking to people far away, or we've got like mixed environments where there's some people here and some people there, we have all these extra costs that get plugged into it, which make it much harder to do. So since I'm primarily a designer, I'm really interested in what can I do as a designer? What kinds of things can I build that make this process easier and faster and more effective? So part of how I think about this is by starting with a different question, which is what's already part of common ground? What can I assume in a conversation with somebody that we share and we know that we share before we even say anything? Maybe that'll give us a clue as to how we can plug into this faster than just, say, have a conversation. So two things struck me on this point. Uh, one of the things that we share is identity information. So if I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, we both know things about each other. So we can tell sort of height and age and probably gender. Um, we can tell information about clothing, that if we know what color we're wearing, we know um, something about ethnic background, color of skin. All of these things are things that I, I know about you and you know about me, and we both know that that's recursive. So those are things that could be the topic for discussion. Um, the other thing is environment. So things like weather, things like where we are, things about the place we're in. Those are things that we also assume that people around us are aware of and can be part of a conversation. So in some ways, this is like, what is small talk? Like, what are the things you can say to somebody without knowing anything else about them? Well, you could talk about the clothes they're wearing. You could compliment their shoes. You could talk about the weather. You could talk about how often you come to this place. Like, those are the things that we can talk about before we talk about anything else. So that's the stuff that just starts in common ground. And so the theme here seemed to me to be that part of the way we can shortcut this process is just by adding information to the environment. That when we put stuff into the environment around us, it's a shortcut into this common ground because I can see that you can see it and you can see that I can see it and so we can talk about it. It, it gets there without us having to necessarily have an explicit conversation about every little thing in the environment that changes. And this isn't really surprising, right? I mean, this is why we use whiteboards. We go to whiteboards, we draw things, and that becomes this shared visual environment that is part of common ground. That's, that's part of why we do it. Uh, for the same reason, that's why we do, as designers, we do sort of post-it design exercises. We're exporting information into our environment because that's a way of making it concrete and making it shared. That when I draw a picture, it's a way for you and I to be seeing exactly the same thing. Whereas when I'm talking, I have to do this presentation and you have to accept it. It doesn't really scale up that well. When we have lots of people, it's hard to know that everybody's on the same page. But when I'm drawing a picture, it's easier to have a concrete thing to talk about. So in a lot of ways, people doing this kind of work have learned this lesson already, that pushing information into the environment is a really nice way to build this common ground more rapidly. And then perhaps most simply, we do presentations with visual aids. That part of why we have things like PowerPoint and the reason why I have slides is because I want to be able to show you stuff. I want to be able to have diagrams and have words that 
you see and that I can see and that I know that you see. So I can talk about the stuff that's on slides without necessarily having to describe every detail to you. So this was really my, my takeaway from doing this reading. When I, was, when I first read this, it really struck me that this might be a way to think about sort of doing design generally. So what I want to do at this point is switch gears. That's like the intro theory part. We're done with that. And I want to talk about two specific projects. Um, I mean, to be fair, this is kind of a sort of post hoc connection between these. I didn't really sit down with these projects and say, like, I'm going to do it because I'm really interested in this, this uh, conversational grounding stuff. But I think it's a really nice way to think about them. I think it suggests an interesting direction that I hope will be compelling to you guys. So <clears throat> um, the first project I'm going to talk about is some moderately older work. This was a, a system called Backchannel. Uh, spelled backchan.nl. It's a website. You can go there. And uh, this was work we presented at CHI two years ago. Uh, so with me, a colleague of mine, Josh Green, and Judith Donath, who was at the Media Lab. So the question that really motivated us here was, how can we improve question asking at panels and presentations? And if we reframe that in terms of this common ground notion, we could ask, how do we create common ground between presenters and their audiences? Now, in some ways, this is a really easy problem because from a common ground perspective, presentations and panels are really tough places to create common ground. Uh, and the core problem is that when you're presenting, I'm doing a lot of presentation in the common ground sense. I'm just saying a lot of stuff, and I don't get a lot of acceptance back from you guys. And so I have to sort of survive on just saying things and hoping that you understand. Um, so really, any way we can sort of bolster that acceptance line, we're going to be doing a better job. Um, now, we do have a little bit of, of information. So I can see when people nod. I can see when people say yes. Some, if someone said OK, like, that would be a little bit weird. But you could kind of do that. Um, but you can't really do the relevant next turn thing at all. So I'm, I'm mostly just stuck with continued attention and a little bit of body language. Although even that goes away if you're doing distributed presentations. So I don't know if you've had the experience of trying to present on the phone to a silent audience. It's really, really hard. And I think that's just evidence of this acceptance channel being completely gone. You just have nothing, and you're talking into a void and hoping that it works. And that's really disconcerting. So I think that's this is sort of a way to think about why that's such a problem. It's because you never have this back channel. You never have the acceptance information from people. And by the way, back channels as an idea, so I stole the word for this project, but really the original back channel was the ahas and the yas in conversation. That was a word that originally described this acceptance process, that sort of class of non-speech things we do to show that, yeah, OK, we're good. We, we can keep going. Um, so that sort of changed a lot. People talk about back channels in a lot of different ways now, but originally it was this, this speech-oriented term. OK. so. When we were thinking about presentations, we had this core question, which was, how do we create a system that helps us get around some of the problems with asking questions and then helps audience members create common ground both with the presenters and with other audience members? And as we started this project, this was motivated by a specific conference that uh, a friend of mine was organizing, and they wanted a better way to run it. And so they had some experience in the past. And so they sort of laid out this problem, and they said, look, we run these really long panel sessions. They were running three-hour panel sessions, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but it had some benefits. They really liked doing it that way. They were pretty keen on it. But they said, well, the problem is questions are biased towards content at the end. So the last of the panelists to talk tended to get the most questions. Uh, it was biased towards certain kinds of people. Not everybody wants to stand up at a mic and ask a question. There's plenty of people who might have really interesting questions who don't want to do that. Um, or maybe just aren't confident that anybody else cares about the answer. So that people who are really confident tend to just get up there and ask their question. Uh, the audience can't control the content of asked questions. So you get people who go up to the mic and ask these like really elaborate or specific questions that nobody cares about and really aren't appropriate, but you're stuck with them, right? Because they stood in line, they get to ask their question. That's it. You don't really have any kind of moderation technique there. And finally, there's just not any way for audience members to talk to other audience members. There might be things about being an audience member that you'd want to communicate about with other audience members. So like sound, if you want to say you can't hear in the back of the room, you don't really have a channel for that. You don't have any way to say to other audience members, hey, can you hear? Or, are you having trouble hearing too? You're sort of stuck. So what we built was a web-based tool. And it's got a couple of parts, which I'll, I'll run through screenshots of. Um, 
But the basic idea was you would have a web-based tool where people could, could post questions, post comments. They could see other people's comments. They could vote comments up and down. And then we would project the top-rated comments in the room. So that gets us back to the sort of mutual understanding notion that you could see comments on your laptop, but even if you didn't have your laptop open, you still had a way of seeing what was going on. And I'll show you some pictures of how that looks in a second. So this is the web interface. Um, very briefly, the first thing you do when you show up uh, is you decide how you want to be known. We don't do any kind of uh, confirmed identity. I don't care about your email address. You can change names as often as you want. You can say, my name is Jesus, like whatever. I don't really care. The point is just that when you do things on the site, it's attributed to this. Uh, and it's a name and an affiliation pair. This is what the, actual, the full web interface looks like. Um, and it's got three main parts. The first is the question asking part. So you can see it's got my name up there. I can type into the text area the question I want to ask. Uh, you've got some limit. It's like 235 characters. So it's longer than a tweet, but shorter than an essay. And then you can hit submit. So these are the top posts. So you can see next to them, they've got little uh, arrows up and down with numbers next to them. So those numbers represent the number of positive votes something gets and the number of negative votes something gets. And in that section, they're ordered by, um, it's not quite the, like, the sum of the positive minus the negative or anything. It's a sort of tricky scoring algorithm, which I can talk about later if you're curious. But in general, it basically is, what is the highest rated recent post? So there's some pressure for old posts. Things that are, they get a lot of votes early on will get sort of pushed off later by newer things with fewer votes. And it's a little bit complicated. But basically, you just think about it as the most popular posts right now. And that's the chunk that gets projected on the screen in the room. And then if you're on the web, you have this other chunk, which is the recent posts. So this is sorted by time, not by score. So whenever somebody adds a new thing, it gets inserted at the top right here. And then we'll, we'll push down all the other ones. So when you're on the web, your experience is you're sort of looking at the top ones because you're curious, but you also watch new questions come in. And you say, oh, I like that one. Up. Oh, that's stupid. Down. And you sort of curate as you're watching the presentation. There's also a mobile interface. Um, these are all iPhone screenshots, but it's just a website, so you can use it on any device. So you can see you can choose which, um, which event you're at. You can say who you are, and then it's got a similar looking thing. It's got a top post. If you scroll down, you get to the upcoming posts. Uh, it's a smaller screen, so it's a little bit less dense. You've got to do a little more scrolling, but it basically does what you need to do. So this is what it looks like when you are in the event. So you can see we've got some panelists down here at the bottom. This is the projection. Taking pictures of this stuff is really impossible because it's always these dark rooms with these really bright screens. So like this is the best I can do. But you can kind of imagine. We've got a big screen. Uh, this screen here was never used for presentations. These people didn't bring slides. This was just a sort of placeholder image for the whole three-hour panel. Um, and then you can't really tell, but right here is a monitor. So this is a mirror of that one over there. So the, the presenters can see what's going on, too. And that's really critically important. So we talk about this mutual acceptance, that I need to see it, and you need to see it, and we need to know that we both see it. So you've got to get these sight lines right. And so whenever I deploy this, we always have these huge fights about this, because places will say, oh, I don't want to get another screen there. I don't want to have to split the DVI kit. Like, you really need to. Because for, for this to work at all, the presenters need to be part of it. And when you get it right, it's actually, it works really, really well. So, and when you're watching, you'll see the panelists look down at it. So they'll be looking out at the audience, and they'll look down. And they'll be, you can see them clearly reading the questions. And it's super gratifying, because you know that the thing that you typed in, that people voted up, they're reading it right now. And in these three-hour panels, what happens is, uh, like, there is a moderator, but the moderator sort of got phased out over time, because the panelists would start pulling questions off. They would see a question and say, oh, that's a thing I want to talk about. That's something somebody asked. I think that's interesting. I'm just going to break in and talk about that next. Or they would do some synthesis. They would pull a couple of questions together. Uh, and then answer them all at once. So it was a really nice way for them to know uh, what was happening, what, what was going through the audience's mind. Uh, and it was also very gratifying for the audience. And so we did have a microphone in these contexts. We didn't like cut off that channel entirely. Um, but we sort of alternated back and forth. And then the panelists would pull mostly from this board. And it sort of turned into a pretty happy medium. So just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that people are posting, um, I've got them in two categories. There was some work um, by McCarthy on early back channel stuff. And so he had this framework of calling things work, logistics. And I think the third one was play, although we don't really have many of those. So we'll call these the work 
questions, and these are not like work in a like an office sense, but just they're they're focused on the event. They're sort of relevant questions. Um, so yeah, so things like uh, hearing more about buzz marketing. There was a, a marketing session here. Um, yeah, basically all of these are just topical questions, and and even something like the last one for Moot, the founder of 4chan. That was a reasonable question in that context. That was a useful contribution. 4chan is a site where memes come from. Moot ran 4chan. Sure, ask him what his favorite meme was. Um, and part of what I think is interesting about these is that in terms of the grounding notion, we can think of these as relevant next turns. That this is giving the audience a chance to speak back. So when the presenter is saying stuff, the audience can't stand up and say something, but they can type it in here. And so if they're asking a question about buzz marketing, uh, <clears throat> like a sort of detailed drill down question, they're acknowledging that they understood the last thing that person said about buzz marketing, would like to hear more about that thing. So this is how we can think about closing that loop back. We're not letting the audience just speak randomly. We're giving them this structured way to respond to the presenter that helps sort of make it clearer to the presenter that the audience is on board and understands what's going on. Uh, they also represent a stronger signal of continued attention. So we had those three ways to accept. We could acknowledge, we could do a relevant next turn, or we could do continued attention. So engagement in this system shows continued attention. You're not going to be asking a question if you're not paying attention. So the, the flow of these is a way of just reinforcing to the presenter, yep, okay, things are good. People are paying attention. We're getting questions. We're moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can tell from the kinds of questions. I mean, if you're totally checked out, like you couldn't have asked that question if you weren't paying attention. I think there are kinds of questions that are obvious. Like the, the last one is probably context independent. You could have walked in the room, paid attention to nothing, and asked that question. There's a lot of questions, I think, that are context dependent, and that in the way they ask the question, they're showing either their attention or their understanding of previous things that have been said. I agree, it's not sort of a categorical thing. It's not that all posts represent attention. Uh, and certainly votes probably don't represent attention necessarily. You can vote just based on what you know and what you're seeing on the screen. But I think relevant questions do represent both a sort of a signal of understanding and their continued engagement with what's going on. Uh, so the other category of things that we see which wouldn't make sense at all in a just standing up to a microphone and asking questions context are logistical things. So we saw a lot of stuff like, are people cold? We had audio questions. Um, I liked the camera finding one. We actually saw that a lot. People would ask for chargers for things. Like they had forgotten their, their laptop charger. Anybody else have the same kind of charger? Can we meet somewhere? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of fighting back that happens. Like moderators would ignore this at their own peril because when they had their own list of questions and they just sort of wanted to roll down that list, you'd start getting things like this. And these just shoot to the top. Like I think this one, yeah. Well, one like this one was the top most rated question in the entire conference. People get really anxious, not anxious, they get sort of upset when they've got this expectation that they can participate and then the moderator sort of cuts them off. Um, I think that's really great. It does take conference organizers a little bit of getting used to. It takes moderators a lot of getting used to. Uh, we can talk about that more if you're curious. Um, and then sort of suggestion stuff like, um, like, uh, like power strips. So I, I think the reason why these work, and these often happen at the beginning of sessions, these didn't get a lot of votes. So you'd start a new session, which sort of wipes the board clean, and then you'd see a flurry of these. You'd see five or six sort of logistical things, because it was easy to get to the top at the start of a session. But as soon as people started talking and submitting real things, these would just get pushed off instantly. So you had this like good real estate that people could take advantage of. Um, you'd also see people advertising other back channels. So people would get on and say, we're on Skype on this chat channel, or join us on IRC at blah, blah, blah. So they would co-opt this as a way to advertise other places to interact, which I think is a really great story. Yeah. If you're up there presenting, mm -hmm. and we're all looking at you, that's a mild back channel. Yeah, oh, if for sure. If we're all typing on our laptops, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't you find that distracting or... Why aren't they looking at me? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's two ways to answer that. One is, when I'm in the room and this is happening, this is not the reason their laptop is open. If their laptop is open, it's because they're doing a million other things anyway. So I think the problem is a general one. That as a speaker, 
you can't, you don't automatically deserve and command everybody's sort of non-distracted attention completely. Much as we would like that to be the case, it's just not true. And we sort of have to acknowledge that. The other, so, so basically, I don't think this is reason enough to distract people. People have their laptops open for other reasons. Um, I also hope that the mobile interface helps us a little bit. So we didn't have the mobile interface when we first wrote this paper. Uh, but now, you don't have to use your laptop, you can do it on your phone, and it's a little bit less distracting. I agree, it is distracting. People typing is really annoying. I'm not a huge fan of it either. But I think it's just part of the ecosystem we need to live in. But I hope the phone interface will sort of be the best of both worlds. You can do the participation, it's not loud, it doesn't get in the way, it's not this like barrier between me and you. Um, but I think then you still get the benefit of the, of the back channel participation. Yeah? Uh, I would just call the iPad in this case basically a laptop. I mean, it doesn't have the sound problem, but uh, I guess I'd call it a phone in this case. I don't know. We can talk, the next project is an iPad project. We can talk a lot more about iPads. Yeah? Mm. Uh, she, she said that they only, people only find it distracting if they themselves can only do one thing at a time. Uh, and I think there's different kinds of distracting. I think the audio channel can just be loud. And I don't think that's really distracting necessarily. It just sort of decreases the audio contrast in the room and that can be a problem. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that... Right. Right. No, I... I yeah. I, so she's saying that, that she, just because she has her laptop open doesn't mean she couldn't verbatim repeat everything I've said in the last five minutes. Um, I think that's more relevant to the question of how do presenters manage the back channel while they're speaking. That's the thing that a lot of presenters would say. We would talk, I'd go up and talk to them before they started and say, we're going to have this system up. People are going to be asking questions. Uh, here's where you can look. Here's how things get here. Here's ways you might deal with this. And a lot of people say, oh, God, I just don't want to deal. It's just too much work. Presenting is too cognitively heavy a load to manage this. Uh, I think that's more where this gets in, that you do need to be able to multitask as a presenter to manage this. Um, although, I think presentation is not the sweet spot for this tool. I think panels really are the super sweet spot, because in panels you have a lot of downtime, that you're not talking the whole time, and in that off time, that's when you're looking. But when you've got a, a thing you're trying to say, you just say your thing. You're not trying to, on a minute or sort of sentence by sentence basis, adjust based on what people are saying. And people aren't talking that fast either. But it's when you're on the downtime that you're adjusting. And that's, I think, the real multitasking story. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, we've never done that. I think there hasn't been enough of a need. If we felt like there wasn't enough involvement, maybe, if it was like if things had slowed down too much, maybe that would be useful. Um, but I think, especially in these three hour sessions that we were running initially, it just went for so long that people were always sort of phasing in and out. It wasn't like the whole audience was rapt attention so much so that they weren't doing anything else. Everybody sort of went in and out the whole time. Um, that does matter more in presentations. We do occasionally run it for presentations, and in that case, we care, or I sort of personally care less about the presentation adjusting in response to questions, because you're not really going to change your slides. You've sort of got the things you're going to say and the order you're going to say them. And in those cases, you more just want them to queue up until the end, and then you can hit the top questions. And so that's a case, I think, where that would make a lot of sense, where at the end, you pause and say, all right, just so you know, we've been collecting questions the whole time, but if you have anything else you want to submit, now is the time to do it, and then we're going to start running through them. Yeah? How large an audience versus how large a panel were you working with? And to what extent do you think that, that makes a difference? Uh, I think it makes a lot of difference. So the paper we originally wrote was focused on two events. One was called Futures of Entertainment, where the ratio was probably it was four to six panelists and an audience of 200, I would say. And then the second event was the first RaffleCon at MIT. And this was a sort of internet culture event. And the, it was probably five panelists to I don't know, somewhere between 200 and 400 audience members. We've really run really small stuff and really huge stuff. I mean, the biggest, the biggest is probably for, well, so these are like uh, audience numbers, not participant numbers. The actual percentage of the audience that's doing stuff is always, not always, I mean, it depends on the audience, depends on internet access and like um, 
power cords under the seats. Like on long conferences, people just run out of energy until they can't do it anymore. Um, so I would say in an audience of like 200, we would see like maybe 50 on and off participants. At any given time, thing, like a really top thing would get 20 votes. That would be a lot of votes for something to get. Um, and so people would sort of check in and out. So that's about the numbers we were seeing. Although we've recently been running events with MIT admissions where they don't want to pay to fly their people around. So they've been running these webcasts where they do a video thing and this is the only question channel. And so in that case, everybody's remote and everybody's doing this a lot. And it like totally bombed the system. Because I'm like, oh yeah, I can do 200 people, but I couldn't do like 200 simultaneous people necessarily. Um, so in that case, we were seeing just huge amounts of participation. I think I have a screenshot of that. Uh, yeah, this, this is from that. All oh, these are not particularly huge, but yeah. So you can see these are all sort of different locational webcasts. So, but yeah, I think it, it, you need to have a critical, oops, you need to have a critical mass of people participating for it to work. Um, but I don't think the number of uh, panelists is really that critical. I think it's mostly just audience size that uh, that really influences the dynamics. Yeah. How does this tool change the way that panel interacts and relates to each other? Hmm. It seems like That's a really good question. Uh, it depends a lot on the kind of panel. So at RaffleCon, in general, the format was you'd have like three different famous internet people who'd been sort of loosely put together in a panel session. That, like maybe had something to do with each other, maybe didn't. And so they didn't necessarily have that much to say to each other. A lot of the questions would be either specific fan questions, so like the, uh, the moot question. That was a 4chan person asking their particular favorite internet person a question. So the other people on the panel, I mean, they could have a favorite meme, but they're not 4chan experts, so it's not really for them. So it doesn't really change it that much in that case. In the Inter Futures of Entertainment panel, uh, be partially because it was so long, you just got a lot of discussion going. It actually influenced it a lot. You saw a lot more back and forth and you'd see panelists pull a question and say like, I think this is really interesting. I want panelist X to answer this. Or I think this about this. Panelist X, what do you think? I know you have a different perspective. I think it had to do partially with the panelists knowing each other and partially with the duration. So I don't really think it has much to do with the tool specifically. I think it's just a general sort of panel dynamic thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, and actually people have. So it's not in this slide deck, but um, The Hills, the MTV show, they had a game called Back Channel. It was designed by Area Code, who some of you might have heard of. And the game was basically, well, actually, so two things. So, so the Area Code game, you would, your goal was to like say witty things and get other people to vote on your witty things. So like someone would walk into a room and say something nasty and someone would type, oh, snap. And like that would get a bunch of votes. And there was a weird scoring mechanism where you got points for saying a witty thing or for voting for a witty thing before other people voted for the witty thing. It was very weird. The other thing is current TV does something like this. Um, and we actually talked, I talked with them a bunch about this because they have their TV channel. This is the, it's sort of crowdsourced TV out of San Francisco. And they do live events sometimes where they do things like this. And they, what they had was a Twitter thing where they had a curated Twitter stream. I think it was for the inauguration or the debates. No, it was the debates. It was for the last presidential cycle, the debates. They had a certain hashtag that was their TV channel hashtag. People could post things and they had people whose job it was that night to just cherry pick stuff. Uh, and so they said like, that was really fun. We want to do more of this. We like this voting thing. I mean, it ends up being the technology doesn't really fit, but the idea I think totally works. Um, the other, there's also a company in Scotland who wants to use it for uh, info, how do, they have like webcast things, like sort of training marketing things that they want people to be able to ask questions during. And so then it's like a TV thing. It's not that it's going to be on the TV necessarily, just that they're going to run this in the background and then feed the questions to their panelists. So it's like a route into the TV studio. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen a situation where, I, I know the first time I became aware of back channels was I can't remember the name of this conference. It was some kind of conference where there was a panel discussion and uh, there was a revolt in the audience. And it was via Twitter. Uh, yeah, this is the interview of Zuckerberg, I think. Uh, you guys probably know better than me. Yeah, just, there's, been a, there's been a couple things like that. Yeah. Um, um, We'll get back. There's a Twitter slide later. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, it's, a, it's a super interesting issue and I, I have what I think is an explanation, but um, let's move on and we'll get there in a second. Um, okay, so we did that. 
Um, the other thing that's interesting about voting, so you can imagine a system like this that works basically the same way, but just doesn't vote. Uh, you'd have trouble with the top things, but maybe you could figure out some way to do it. But I think voting is really important because voting gives you a w gives the community a way to develop norms. So uh, it, it's different between events, which is also valuable. Different events can have different kinds of norms. But in general, the snarky comments just got zeroed out. And the really productive things went up. So this is basically just a really simple way to say, like, voting kind of works. I mean, it depends on your audience. You can have audiences that like snarky things. But in that case, they deserve snarky things. That's fine. And, and Raffle Khan. <laughs> And RaffleCon was that audience. I mean, there was a panel where somebody very meticulously posted all the lyrics to Never Gonna Give You Up and then <laughs> voted them up and down so that they were in order in the top list. Like, they would, <laughs> they would change accounts because you can't vote more than once on one account, but you can change accounts as much as you want. So it was this, like, cadre of people in the back of the room cycling identities. I could sit there in the database and see people like, one, two, one, two, three, one, 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 just, like, changing names constantly to sort of move it up and down. And then when it, like, all was there, everybody cheered, and like, okay, fine. That's what you want to do, that's what you can do. I mean, the problem at that point was I wasn't sure if I should, like, there's a mechanic for marking things as answered, so that questions that get answered don't stick there. And I was like, I, is that answered or not? I, like, I don't know, so I just left it there. We sort of clogged the system up, because they all had, like, 100 votes, because they were, like, constantly shifting the balance, but, yeah, it was, it was tough. Uh, yeah, th this is another sort of classic 4chan thing, the mud kips joke which just doesn't play well. I mean, the audience wasn't enough of those people for that to work, so it got, gets voted down. Um, okay, so this, back to this picture of the space again. So the other thing I want to say about the, present, the, the projection I think is important is that it needs to not be distracting. Um, and I, when I say distracting, I mean, one, it shouldn't draw too much attention to itself, and two, that it needs to be easy to read. And so it doesn't need to, it can't change too quickly. Because if it changes too quickly, then we start to break that mutual understanding bounds. Because if I look away and I'm not looking at it for 60 seconds, and I look back and it's totally different, then I've missed stuff. And so all of a sudden we've violated that notion that we all see the same thing. So one of the things we were really careful with in this, and that I think is really easy to mess up about this common ground story, is if things are moving too fast, you can't really create common ground anymore because not everybody's paying attention to it. Um, and again, the, the sight lines are really critical. It needs to be seen by all participants and by all panelists. And that's, I think, one of the really hard things to do about these interfaces as sort of a, a, a general thing. Um, uh, How often did you update it? So it would update, I think, every 30 seconds. But the way the scoring mechanism worked, it was just super low frequency. Like it high passed just, or low passed everything. And so things just didn't change that often in the underlying model. Yeah? So I've been waiting, I guess, for several slides. It's is that your classification of the kinds of interactions that took place, work, and logistics? Is there more to it than that? Uh, so I didn't do that. That was from somebody else. But that was just sort of bins I put things in as a way of thinking about them. Like, what I'm thinking about is part of common ground, especially if it's on a level, mm -hmm. if this is sort of hierarchical common yeah. ground, um, if the, in the instances you're describing, but level of common ground also has to do with the negotiation of meaning. Mm -hmm. And especially in a third space theory context, negotiation of meaning is, is one of the most important things that happens. Yeah. And then once you've negotiated the meeting, meaning, mm -hmm. uh, then you can begin to, to do the rest of the work. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, that feels absent to me from what you're talking about. I, I thought I'd say it feels yeah. absent to <clears throat> No, no, I think that's a really good point. So I, I agree, I'm stretching it here. I, I mean, I think when you say it's a hierarchical common ground, I think that's a really good point. This, this is not strictly a conversation, and I'm sort of trying to apply conversational tools to a non-conversational situation. Um, and I think you'll see something that looks more like the negotiation you expect in the next project. Um, yeah, hmm. I'll have to think about that some more. I, I think basically you're right to say that there's not negotiation because we don't have the back and forth. But I think there's something that's a little bit sort of has whiffs of negotiation in the voting. So when I say I want things to be this way and other people say yes, that's not strictly a negotiation, but it is an acknowledgement that we have some agreement. So it's sort of like you get something kind of like an outcome of negotiation without the back and forth. And if you disagree with me and you think they should do something else, you post your other thing. So it's a really sort of poor version of it, but you can get things that are a little bit like it enough, I think, to think about it in this way. That seem reasonable? 
Let's talk later about okay. the hierarchical nature. I'm okay. not sure this is common ground. Okay. I think this may be something very different. Okay. Uh, it's your talk, so I'm going to stop. All okay. right. Well, we can we can talk later, and maybe you can give another talk about how there's other ways to do it. Um, okay. Where were we? All right. So we're going to talk about chat. So there's been a couple of other ways people try and do this. Um, chat is one of them. People will make little chat channels that sit on the side. Um, I think this fails just for the visibility reason. Not everybody can see this kind of thing, so it's hard to say that the things that happen in these chat channels are, are relevant to the larger discussion. Um, people have tried projecting chat rooms, uh, which suffers for basically the same reason. You get visibility, but it's moving so fast, it's hard for anybody to see what's going on, and um, uh, especially presenters, that maybe the audience can track it, but the presenters definitely can't track it because it's moving too quickly. And finally, Twitter. This gets back to your point earlier that Twitter is super popular for this kind of thing, and people will project a Twitter stream behind the audience. I think this wasn't actually what happened in the Zuckerberg case. I think people in the audience were just sort of agitating on their own, but in some sort of loud way. I don't know exactly how it happened. But um, the problem here is, again, one of rate. Things happen too quickly. But I think more importantly, it's one of audience, that Twitter has this sort of weird layered notions of audience, that when you're tweeting things, you're tweeting to your followers. But when you've got a hashtag, you're also tweeting to people who are looking at the hashtag, but you don't necessarily know who those people are. And people tweet in very different ways. There are people who will live tweet and just say, will sort of quote things that are going on or talk about funny things that they saw happen. And some people will provide commentary. Some people provide questions. And so that weird uh, confluence of all of those things makes it really hard to keep track um, so in terms of these costs we talked about earlier, the reception costs for this are really high. That you can read it, but you can't read everything. And if you read everything, you can't really pay attention. So it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really work as a way to, to build common ground. Um, now in terms of those, those fights, I think the reason they happened, the other one you might have heard about was Dana Boyd got in trouble at, I think it was like Enterprise 2.0. And there were, it, this was a projection situation. They projected a Twitter stream behind her. So she couldn't see it, but everybody in the audience could. And I think that's the core problem there, that you have this, this weird audience mismatch where you're talking behind someone's back, like quite literally. It's projected behind her, and she can't read it. And she doesn't know what's going on, but people in the audience all see it. So they've got this split space where they've got this space where they can talk about her, and like, it's super uncomfortable. So I think what, what's wrong with that setup is not that Twitter is bad or that projecting things is bad or that supporting audience conversations is bad. It's really that you don't want them to be disjoint. You don't ever want to have a system where the audience can say things to the entire audience without the person knowing. And this is really just sort of common courtesy, common sense. Like you, you don't want to like go out of your way to support people talking behind someone's back and it can blow up really easily. Yeah? I'm curious, have there been conferences where there's a Twitter screen, Twitter, Twitter screen in front of the audience and in front of the speaker so that people are in sync? I haven't seen that. I, I think even if you did it, you would still have the reception problem that the presenter can't be looking at it because it moves too quickly. And so even if there's something incendiary happening, you might just not notice it, especially since Twitter is relatively low density. Somebody might say something really nasty about you that people like send specific links to other people or people respond to. But if you didn't see the original thing, you have no way to go back and see it. So stuff just sort of flows by in this really unmanageable way. Um, so I haven't seen that done, but I don't suspect it would really matter that much. Um, OK. So I think that's basically it for this project. Do we have any final questions before we move on? OK, cool. All right, so we're going to leave presentations for a second. Well, I guess for more than a second for the rest of the talk. And we're going to talk about a different question, which is how can we help create common ground among meeting participants? So this is some really early work. I haven't written this stuff up yet, and I'm still very much doing the engineering on this. So it's all in flux, and it's all going to change. But I thought I would show it off and see what you guys think. Um, and I think it uh, provides sort of another way to think about this stuff. So the, the question I'm interested in here is, what kinds of things do small distributed groups have trouble keeping track of? What are the things that small distributed teams do uh, that they sort of have a hard time keeping track of? or uh, could use support doing better? And how can we create new channels that might help them do this common ground process? So the case I'm interested in is a heterogeneous one. I'm, I'm not concerned about like the everybody remote case, although I think solutions that work 
for a heterogeneous case probably work for an all remote case. I'm more concerned with situations where you have like a couple people in one place and a couple people in another, maybe, maybe one or two sort of solo people. But these cases where there are all different kinds of places, um, there isn't necessarily infrastructure. So there are lots of solutions for distributed meetings where you say, all right, we're going to have three super great screens and a bunch of HD cameras and great microphones. And that's cool, but when you're not in that space, that stuff falls down. So I'm interested in focusing on this heterogeneous problem um, of how do you do it without building a lot of fancy infrastructure. And the, the main problem that I think happens in audio conferences is this speaker change issue. So when we talk about the costs to figuring out who's going to talk next, most of the ways we communicate about who's going to talk next are visual and sort of nonverbal. So if I want to talk next, I might, at a table, I might lean in or I might sort of make eye contact or maybe I would raise my hand. Um, but on an audio conference, often you're on mute and you don't want people to hear you and you, they certainly can't see you. So even things like an intake of breath, which might mean you're getting ready to speak, that just doesn't work. And we also have latency problems where the people will leave gaps in their speech to sort of let people break in if they want to. They'll, they'll yield potentially. But if you've got a little bit of latency, by the time I hear the gap and say something and you hear the thing I said, you've started back up again. And so then you get this collision and you have to like renegotiate out of it. And so all of this comes from the properties of audio conferencing which is really like sort of what we're stuck with. And, and video doesn't really make it any better. Video doesn't solve those things that much better. Um, it helps a little bit on the telling who wants to talk case, but it doesn't like totally solve the problem. And so because we've got this, these issues of speaker change, all the stuff we take for granted in the sort of present accept process, we kind of lose track of because it's so hard for us to switch between and so you get a lot of people talking for longer periods and not doing the back and forth that really helps this process work well. So the plan I'm going to describe is that we put iPads in every room. Uh, we don't have one for every person, but we have one in each location, or as many in each location as we need that everybody can see it. And the notion is that we'll use the screen uh, as a way to sort of visualize the accumulation of understanding about what's going on in the meeting. So we'll be able to put things on that screen that everybody can see and then say, all right, that's stuff that we all agree on without necessarily having to do the back and forth with everybody on the call, which takes a long time because we've got these speaker change costs. So the three things we want to keep track of are time and tasks and topics. And I'm, I think, just going to jump into a real demo. Um, this is going to take one second to set up. Um, <clears throat> so this is an iPad interface, but I'm not going to show it to you on an iPad because you couldn't see it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run a fake iPad. Oops, one second. We're going to start it. There we go. Um, <clears throat> oops, that's not what we want. Come back. There we go. OK. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick demo of the stuff that it does. And then we'll talk a little bit about why it does it and why I think that's interesting. OK. So it's a little tough to imagine this, but um, the idea is that you have this in the middle of your table and in each location, as many as you need to, to see things. And we've got a bunch of different parts to this that I'll go through. Um, so the first is this notion of time tracking. So we've got a clock in the middle. Uh, and the clock is just showing the current time. But it's also sweeping out sort of the history of time spent in the meeting, showing you what things you've done in the past. And that's divided into these individual topic chunks. And the topic section on the right is the key for that. So at the top, we've got sponsor week planning. That's pink. You can see the little pink triangle there. Uh, and then that's the first thing we talked about. And then we talked about conference report. And then now we're on paper discussion. And that's the thing that's getting swept out now. So this helps us keep track of both uh, where we are now and also where we're going in the future. And these are things that people are thinking about already in a meeting. But by making them visual, we're sort of reminding everybody. And we can see the things at the bottom are, are upcoming, ta upcoming topics that we might want to talk about. And so as these accumulate, you start to get this feeling like there's a lot of stuff we need to talk about. I wasn't really, I'd sort of forgotten. Like I had my topic and you had your topic. But when we put them here, we realize like there's a lot of stuff to get done. And if we only want to be here for an hour, we're going to need to start moving through these things more quickly. So the notion is that we're using this visual channel to sort of insert this information, remind everybody of what they might have known, but we're making it more explicit. And the hope is that that will make it easier to have conversations about these things. That 
you might be thinking, wow, I really need to get out of here. We've got a lot of things to talk about. But that can be a hard thing to bring up sometimes. But having the, the visualization of that, I, the hope here is, and then, like I said, this is early. We haven't done a ton of testing yet. But the hope is that that will sort of encourage people to talk about hard topics that they might not have gotten to otherwise. Um, so just to show you how it works, we can, and this is sort of lame because it's a cursor, but imagine it's a finger. Uh, so you can swipe over and say, like, there's a new topic I want to start on the iPad. Um, the other major thing we keep track of is tasks. Um, and tasks are sort of connected to people. So you can see around the edge, we've got just the, the different people who are involved in the meeting right now. So it knows who's, who's there, which in and of itself is a useful thing. When you get on a call, you don't necessarily know who's there because they've probably turned their microphones off. Um, the people who uh, are in the same places have this bar with them. So those, these four people are all in one place. The two people in the corner are in a place. And then Jaywoo is alone. So this here is our sort of task bin. So when somebody says, oh, we need to do something, you can throw a task in here. And you can do it either on the iPad itself. There's a little plus button, and I can type in a task. Um, or there is a, a mobile phone interface, just like on back channel. Uh, so you can be in the meeting. You can, someone can say something. You can pop your phone open. And you can type in, uh, I have a new task. And it'll pop up there. Uh, once the tasks are there, you can drag and drop them on people. Uh, we can just dish out some things to do. Um, when people get tasks, they get these little notches next to them, which show you how many tasks they have at a glance. So this is about reminding people about how much work somebody has to do already. Um, and, and that's about just moderating how the stuff gets distributed. You don't want people, like one person shouldn't have everything. So you want to be able to remind people of that. And that can also be a hard thing to say, that if somebody says, oh, Stephanie should do that. And Stephanie's like, I've already got two things. I don't want to have to keep telling them, like, I'm already really busy. So this is a way of, of foregrounding that information, making that something that everybody knows. Um, you can also, oops. Uh, you can also get rid of stuff. If, like, somebody assigns something to Stephanie, she doesn't want it, you can dump it. Um, OK, so that's the basic sort of functional story. The, the complement to this is that this is mostly supposed to be an output device. Um, and then mobile phones should be the input device. So just like on back channel, you can go to a, a site on your phone. It's just a normal website. It would work fine on any phone or an iPad if you had your own personal iPad. And there you have like full detail. You can drill down and see exactly who made everything. You can see, uh, you can start and stop topics. You can restart old topics. Uh, you can manage who's in the room. Like if somebody leaves, you can log them out and say like, oh, they left to remind everybody that they left. Um, so really, all that stuff can be done in both places. <clears throat> the other thing that's important is that when you do stuff on your phone, uh, it will sort of slide out. So like, well, we're not going to do it because that's tempting fate too much. But um, if you add a task, if you're, if you're Stephanie and you type in a new task, Stephanie's name will slide out and it will say, Stephanie added a task. And that attribution is really important. And we'll come to that in a second. So yeah. I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, you know, I'm in a web conference and I'm calling in. And it's great to have this little view, but this is a lot of real estate. Yeah, know? it's a lot of real estate. So do you mean on your computer or? Yeah, like if I'm sitting in a meeting or even calling in a meeting, I'm usually in the process of viewing shared kind of design mm -hmm. slides. And then you have all this, so, so. so <clears throat> there's, there's two things about that. One is that this is supposed to be on the iPad, so it's a separate screen. So we don't want to take up like an actual projection screen in a room. Uh, or even if you're alone at home, if you're, if you're working from home and you've got your desktop, you can have the iPad next to you. And you can sort of go back and forth between those channels. Um, I think probably it's less good if you're literally at the computer. I think there's probably not a lot of sort of desk real estate there. I'm not, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Well, well the pop-up thing I like on the edge, Mm -hmm. If you are the moderator and you've done the task and then it pops out, then mm -hmm. at least if I'm looking at the screen for design, I see I've got a task. Yeah. It's not me, so yeah, I think that's a slightly different a slightly different problem. I think you could imagine a version of this that was a sort of overlay on a WebEx style thing. Like if you if you were at your computer for sure and you wanted this to work in that context, you'd probably yeah use the edges, you'd use more sliding notifications. Um, the other thing to say about this is that I've been thinking lately that probably what you want is a much less busy version. This is like the more active thing. This is if you want to actually sort of grab a hold of it and do things in the meeting. There's probably another version of this that basically just does notifications. It sits in the middle of the table. It's super big. When someone does something, it says, Drew suggested a new task. Drew suggested a new topic. Drew changed the topic. And that's just super large. Really, it draws the attention. 
So even if you're not looking at it, it's going to sort of grab you a little bit. So in that case, you sit at your computer, you have it there, you don't look at it at all until stuff happens. And it's really big and really obvious. And then if you want to mess with it, if you want to like, claim that task for yourself, then you can go into this somewhat more detailed view. Um, but this is all a process. You've got to start somewhere. Yeah? But a plus and a minus on this. Um, I could see this being really useful in a meeting, <laughs> even if everybody was in the same room, mm -hmm. because it kind of forces some rules and lets them, like you said, you know what topics are coming up and you know how much time is being spent. Mm -hmm. And that's something that doesn't happen very much in mm -hmm. these even global mm -hmm. ones. The minus is be, knowing the way meetings really work, in, unless you have a meeting where the topics are either predetermined mm -hmm. or clearly, you know, growing, you know, with yep. another thing. If you use this to merely model a meeting that was happening, right, right. you find that the topic list grew as right. the meeting went on. Right, right. And you're going back and forth a lot and there's not a lot of structure. Yeah. So I think this would be a good way to enforce good meetings, but until we get better meetings. Right. Um, so I think there's two things. One is I think you kind of take it or leave it on a per part basis. That if you want the task tracking and you don't want the topics, sure, whatever. It's probably still useful to know how long you've been meeting and you can sort of have in mind how much more you have to do. Maybe it's not telling you that explicitly, but that's still useful. Um, I mean, even just knowing who's there and when people go and leave, that might be itself useful. Um, the other story is about the motivations for keeping it updated. So that seems like a sort of implicit problem too. Like, why should this actually actively represent what's going on? And I think the reason there is that it gets back to this notion of showing continued attention. So when you're in a distributed situation, often the remote people, you kind of assume that they've checked out because you don't have any evidence otherwise. You don't know that they're still there. And in fact, you often get to the end of the call and you say, okay, is anybody still there? Like, did anybody hear anything? Because I haven't heard anything from you in the last 30 minutes. So this is a way to bypass that stuff. And so if you're remote and you want to be showing people that you're still involved, that's your incentive to keep this stuff updated. So if you're trying to say, look at me, like I'm still here, like I'm helping keep notes, I'm helping keep up to date on topics and tasks, you can be updating this stuff. Yeah, Nicole? What happens if Stephanie leaves the physical world? It's not gonna automatically do it. I mean, that's a thing. I mean, there are lots of automatic sensey things you could do, but that's not really my area. So one answer is, well, we'd sense that, but I'm not going to. So the real answer is somebody on the phone or on the device, like this is a way to add people. Um, I just, uh, so there's, yeah, I, I pushed it and it goes away. Um, so you could say somebody came in with the plus, it's not here yet, but there should be a corresponding minus. Like you should be able to hit Stephanie and say, oh, she's gone and it'll pull her out. But you're going to have to do a little bit of curation. But then I view the curation as this way of showing continued attention. So the curation, not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, the other things you might imagine are things like uh, hand raising, like I'd really like to talk next. You should be able to slide out and say like, I really have something to say and I'm remote, so I'm having a hard time breaking in. Uh, or, yeah, we'll come back to the other stuff. Okay. So let's jump back. I should have a few more things to say and we will be all done. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, so a couple of sort of closing things about this project. And like I said, it's still very much in progress, so I'm still trying to think through how all this stuff works. Um, but coming back to this, this grounding notion, um, the, the idea here is, part of what's going on here is trying to create new kinds of relevant terms. So we've got this continual attention notion or continued attention notion that by doing stuff in the system, you're showing that you're still engaged. The other side of that is you can also be showing that you are understanding. So if I say, we need to make sure to order pizza for next week, and somebody adds order pizza for next week, and somebody else claims that, those all represent people understanding me. So I can sort of move forward confident that I've gotten confirmation and that the task is gonna get done. So I think part of what this is offering is, is ways to sort of create those new kinds of signals. The other thing, and we talked about this already, is this notion of creating new ways to show continued attention. So in some ways, all of these maintenance tasks are busy work as a way to get signals from other people who are remote that they're still involved. 
so I, I think it's useful because not only are, it's not like totally busy work, because we get a lot of value out of it. The hope is that we keep track of tasks better, we maybe manage our time better, or maybe it's just that at the end of the meeting we want to get a sort of uh, a timeline back out. We've got all this metadata about the meeting now that people have put together, so we can write an email out to everybody and say, these are the things we talked about, this is what we didn't get to, these are things people said they're going to do. Um, so we're building this sort of object that represents the meeting uh, as a result of people's continued attention. And also I think people have some sort of uh, mental time to spare. That in a meeting, it's useful to have ways to be a good meeting participant that aren't speaking. Because in a lot of meetings, it's not necessarily good for everybody in the room to be speaking. And there are ways to be a good meeting participant that aren't verbal. And this is about sort of propping those up and saying to people, look, if you are really good about keeping track of tasks, that's a useful thing for everybody and you should be acknowledged for that, especially if you're remote. And the same is true for note taking. You can imagine that when you're taking notes, your name slides out and says, Drew is taking notes right now. And everybody knows that I'm taking notes and when I send the meeting, the minutes out afterwards, nobody else was also taking notes. We didn't have to duplicate any effort. So it can sort of serve as a status indicator for people. Can you people out of the meeting? Ooh. <laughs> I don't know. I had a, a previous project that was like half a joke and half serious where it was an audio conferencing system where you had a virtual currency. So if you ran out of, like every time you were speaking, it would sort of like tick down your money and when you hit zero, it would just cut you off. Uh, and so the idea was to try and like normalize participation in the meeting and you could like give your money to other people like if you wanted them to speak. Which is like everybody laughs at it because it's people have all been in meetings where they like want someone to stop talking and would love to be able to like make them stop talking. Um, or a system to step in for them and make them stop talking, but I think in practice it's just a thing you end up fighting with more than is useful. Um, so like I said, this is still a very much in progress thing, so there's a couple of things that uh, I really want to get in there. So we talked about hand raising briefly. Um, in that set of, of ways people accept presentations, there was acknowledgement, uh, relevant next turns, and continued attention. So we've talked about the last two, but we haven't talked about acknowledgement. I think it'd be really cool to have a way for people just to sort of nod, just to say like, yeah, uh-huh, we got it, we're good. Uh, and that could just sort of be um, a sort of uh, a flurry of attention. People are saying, yep, okay, you can move on, or I agree, or, or that kind of message. Might be kind of overwhelming, I don't know, still playing with that one. Uh, I'm also interested in the iPad itself sort of interrupting on time management issues. So time management is a really hard thing to have conversations about that you'll often want to say, let's move on. This is a boring topic, but it's really hard to be the person who speaks up and says that, especially if the person who's talking is a sort of high status person in the meeting. So I've been playing with the idea that the program itself just interrupts and it starts flashing. It's like, you should be done now. You've been talking for too long. And either you can sort of pat it down and be like, no, 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 we need to keep talking. Or it forces the conversation. And it sort of does the socially awkward thing for you. And everybody knows it's stupid, so it's not its fault if it picks the rad bad time. But if it picks a good time, sort of at random, like, then maybe that would be useful. And I kind of think about it like, um, liquor stores where they have machines that uh, sort of say yes or no to your ID. It's a way of the human sort of divesting themselves of the social awkwardness of rejecting your card. So you give it to the machine, the machine says no, and then the person behind the counter says, well, it's not my fault, I can't really help you. The machine said no, I wish I could. So this is a way of just making machines do these socially uncomfortable things for us. I don't know, I think it might work, it might not, I'd like to try it. Um, and then the last thing is helping with display issues. So doing things like document sharing, it'd be great to be able to just flash like a website or a PDF or a picture to everything. In your room, you can hold it up and point at things. When you point, those taps can get sent, you can move around, that stuff all gets synced up at every location. So you help you get this shared visual space again. Uh, and then uh, whiteboards. It'd be great to be able to do a little whiteboard thing. But anyway, those are future things that I hope to get to at some point. Um, I'm also looking for people to help test this out. So if you would like to try this, I would love to talk to you. Um, it's basically all real. There's some rough edges that I'm working on, but I'd love to find venues to give it a shot and see what we can learn. Um, so very briefly, just to sum up, um, I'm sort of interested in this question of how we can make it easier to add to common ground, and I think the takeaway that I've been focusing on is this notion of adding information to the environment. That that's a kind of shortcut we can use to help get to common ground more quickly. Um, and the other thing that I think is useful is thinking about this as a framework for identifying both problems and solutions. So we can use the notion of what the costs are in a medium. So when you're, when you're facing a problem where you need to sort of help accelerate understanding, thinking about what it is about the medium itself that imposes these costs and what those costs are. And then on the solution side, saying how can we decrease those costs? So if the problem we think is going on is that it's really hard to change who's talking right now, 
then maybe what you could do is look at an interface that helps sort of facilitate speaker change. So a sort of hand raise interface is a simple thing to think about that. Um, so that's really what I've been thinking about lately. I hope that is useful and interesting to you guys. And I think that's basically all I have to say. So I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. Question. I know there's a big literature on CSCW. I, I don't really know, but I assume people have looked at all the different types of meetings. That you, would you would think. I can't find that. I, well, so there's a little bit. Um, the vast majority is sort of popular press stuff. It's like how to run a good meeting. And so there's a little bit in that space. Um, Every, I ask everybody I talk to about this stuff whether they have seen like a really good taxonomy of meetings paper. Um, and every so often I get whiffs of it, but then they don't email me back with the actual thing. So um, if anybody here has seen that thing, Michael, do you have a? Well, one place to look, and this makes me very, very old fashioned, is total quality management, hmm. which was very much about establishing common ground about how a meeting is done, what the tasks would be. So in a corporate culture in which people talked about total quality management, uh -huh. if you said a fishbone diagram, that was then common language for a certain way of analyzing a problem. Interesting. And so there might be something there for categories. Uh, okay. I'm not sure. Certainly there was the notion of PAL, purpose, agenda, and limit. Uh -huh. the ways of specifying a meeting. Uh -huh. And the limit was usually in terms of time. So the limit was 30 minutes, and then went to 30, minute 31. Yep. We could go. And huh. that was one of the standard. It was rude, but it right. wasn't rude within that context. This is a little bit about what I was saying before. Yeah. Negotiating what the meaning of things is. Yeah. Or meanings are, for that matter. So anyway, <clears throat> it's a place to look. Yeah, I think that's negotiating about what the meeting itself is, not the sort of necessarily, that's like limiting the taxonomy. It's saying like, there is a kind of meeting we can have, we'll call that kind of meeting X. Um, I think the question of like, what is the, the full space of what X can be, I think is really tough. Uh, and I would love to see more work on that. I don't. Maybe it's something for you. I, yeah, it's not really my thing. I mean, like I said, I'm more sort of a designer engineer type. Um, Right, and terrible for others. Yeah, like working meetings, for instance, are clearly a terrible place for this. If you're trying to produce a document, this is just not a thing that's relevant to you. If you're trying to do design work in a room and like crank something out, this is not for you. Totally agree with that. Um, but yeah, I think it is a super interesting design space. You could imagine tools that are focused on these different places um, that would be better for them. Although some stuff I think is just hard. Design meetings in general, I think, distributed design meetings are just a really hard problem. Yeah. Like this yeah, when you add structure, this stuff gets really easy. There's actually a bunch of literature on uh, decision support systems where they'll sort of concoct these really elaborate and really top-down meeting models. And if everybody buys into this, um, it works great. But you've got to get a lot of structure. Like I bet for a TQM meeting, you could build a very specific tool that was really good about managing those limits. That would be really valuable. Um, I've been focusing more on the general case, but I think yeah, there's a wealth of very specific work you could do if you can get everybody to agree on the same page. Yeah, Michael. So I'm finding this really interesting as you can tell since I see you have a lot. Um, and I'm thinking that I'm really intrigued by your second, second case and the notion of extending that into other kinds of common ground. I'm thinking of, say, Casey and I were using American Sign Language. We might talk about you by saying B R E. W uh -huh. is here, uh -huh. and then after that we have a pronoun, group. Yeah. So I'm thinking, are there ways, you have a graphical environment which people are going to pay attention to, uh -huh. do you have placeholders or common reference point, anything like that that you're thinking about? Yeah, I love the sign language example, all those spatial references. And there's been like body-based ones I've seen where people use different parts of their body to reference or like store different information. Uh, I think that stuff is super fascinating. Yeah, I, I think there's no reason you couldn't do that this way. I think it's really all about what domains you're trying to support and what can you cram into one UI. So this is already, I think, over crammed, and I would love to sort of pull stuff out of it if I felt like I could. Um, but yeah, as a design strategy, I think there's a, a lot of rich stuff you could do if you just have the right, right place to do it. Thank you. Yeah. It struck me earlier in your presentation that you were focusing on the back channel because you initially started with a species of meeting that is um, extremely impoverished on the scale the back channel so that it grew out of the academic classroom presentation where there's deliberately no back channel. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at a meeting in the classical sense, like a church meeting yeah. that's run by Robert Toole of Order, mm -hmm. you already have a much richer back channel and a whole lot of procedures in place for handling it. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there's a broad spectrum of ways for people to be together mm -hmm. and uh, evolve common ground, um, much of which is outside the the academic uh, culture. Yeah, I mean, I think I would describe that as being like the TQM meeting, that it's a, it's a, a social way to provide structure around something. So given Robert's rules of orders, yeah, you get a lot of ways to decide what we're currently talking about and how long we're going to talk about it and how do we move between topics. Uh, and, and like with the TQM story, if you can buy into that, uh, one, you're probably going to get better meetings, and two, you probably can make a really specific interface. You can imagine a Robert's rules interface that sort of had the stack, like where you were moving in and out on the topic, what was on the table, what was coming up next, what the vote was. But you don't really need one because you can run it just with people without right. the technology. Oh, well, I mean, certainly, I mean, clearly you can run meetings without this already, right? Like we do it every day and probably will continue to do it every day. So I don't think just because it works now doesn't mean it couldn't be made better. And so I think even a Robert's Rules of Order system, in fact, I think you could build a better interface given that structure. I think that's the argument I'm making here is that Given meeting structure, you can do a better job than this. And the purpose here is to try and assume as little structure as possible and see what we can do with that. Um, but that in general, more structure means, I think, more focused interfaces, which are probably a better experience. But structure is just hard to get to. Yeah, Rachel. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had done any testing on this yet. And not, or even if so, um, how can you measure whether this is effective as opposed to a meeting that doesn't have this tool? Um, so nothing yet. Part, part of the problem with testing is I don't, I don't think I can do a good job if I just bring some college students into a room or bring college students into two rooms and say go. Like I just don't think you can fake it that way, um, which presents me with a really big problem, which is like, so how do you fake it then? And I, I think the, the best or well, the way I'm going with now is try and find people who hold meetings that I can deploy it in. So talking to corporate sponsors, basically. So the Media Lab has got lots of corporate sponsors, and so I basically meet these people and call them up and say, we'd love to test it. And so then I run around and demo it and try and get people excited about it. And then hopefully in the next month or so, we'll have people say, all right, yes, let's get you in. We've got clients lined up. They've got meetings they use our systems for already. So Cisco is one of the companies I work with. Um, they've got this whole body of clients, so I want to go to them. So the question of how it works is a separate one. So this is sort of a methodological thing. So there's not going to be a it is good or it is bad. Testing it is not going to be, I can probably tell you up front, using this is not going to be better than not using it the first couple of times you use it. And probably even the 10th time you use it because it's prototype software. I mean, it's like me and some Europe's who've, who've cranked this stuff out. So there's going to be some rough edges always. So it's not, I mean, metrics like how long do you spend in meetings probably aren't going to be useful. So I think what I would be focusing on is really trying to understand more of the relationship between what having it there does to what goes on. So my ideal setup would be if I can observe meetings before using this and meetings while using this, and sort of a combination of the observation and the, the data that gets collected on in the system, plus talking to people before and after about sort of how they respond to it, how they think about meetings differently when this is there. Because that really gets at the core question, which is how does having this display change people's decision making in meetings? How does it change the meeting process? And that's the thing I think we can get at doing even just a couple of deployments. It doesn't have to be. This isn't a thing I think needs to go super scale to get anywhere. Um, but it's really understanding that relationship between the design decisions that we make and the way that interaction happens afterwards. That's, I think, the sort of core causal link we're trying to make. Not really an efficiency argument per se. I don't think we can really do that very well. Did you just have a question still? Okay. Well, I don't want to get between us and dessert. Is there anything? <laughs> All right. Thank you.